Hello everybody and welcome back to the X-Ray Tony B channel. Once again, we have something that is too big for my bench and really heavy and like, you know, gives you a hernia when you lift it. All those things. It is a Laney ProTube Lead 100 Watt tubular amplifier, guitar amplifier. And part, this is for a friend of mine who uh, got this and uh, wants me to work on it. Supposedly, it mostly works. Just has some minor issues. I don't know. It just wants it checked out. The biggest issue is I've never worked on Laney amplifiers before. Uh, when you read about them online, you hear all kinds of different things. There are some schematics available, but this particular one, I believe this model was built somewhere in the 1980s. Uh, when we turn it around, you'll see what makes it a even a little more difficult to deal with. All right, let's turn this around. First of all, we'll look at the front. And you can see it's a pretty straightforward amplifier with a power and standby. Uh, it has a presence control on it. Something kind of unique I noticed is it has bass, middle, and treble boost by pulling out the knobs. And I'm not even sure about these chicken head knobs. I don't know if these are original to the amp or not. They're really cool looking though. It has a master volume. It has different preamps, a couple different preamps on it, and it is switchable with a foot switch that's not with this thing, but there is a foot switch jack for this. And it even has pull on for preamp one volume. So there's a preamp one level and a preamp one volume. So kind of strange, but uh, I think this thing's all about distortion. So this would be the audio files nightmare an amplifier that's made to distort I don't know I think I'm gonna enjoy this one okay let's flip it around and look at the back it looks pretty obvious that this amp has been serviced before and of course <laughs> the part of that of the the back label that we really need that has the serial number and the model number and all that is conveniently torn off and missing so uh, I did look at a few, uh, there was a video of somebody demoing one of these on uh, YouTube that I was able to see. And so I did get a little information from that. Uh, looking inside, well, let me get a flashlight. You can see that it has been recapped, at least the main caps here. These are all JJ capacitors. You can kind of... I don't know if you could see that or not, but they're JJ capacitors. And see, here's some more of them. Oh, no. So it's been recapped. Uh, there are two different types of EL34 outputs. Uh, these look like, I'm not sure what these ones are. Valve, what's it say? Well, these ones are JJ's, we know. Let's pop one of these out and see real easily. These are a set of Marshall EL34s. How about that? So we have some mismatched output tubes, and I don't know if this amp, you know, some of the circuits, some of the later circuits on some of these amps have auto tube matching. In other words, if you have mismatched tubes, it'll auto adjust the bias. I don't see any bias pots on the outside, but that doesn't mean this amp isn't a fixed bias. Great big transformers. You can see the big power transformer. Great big output transformer. Huge choke coil. So uh, quite a few interesting things here. Uh, so what we're probably going to do is power this amp up and just see if it works in general. Um, again, I was told that, that it worked, 
but it just ha made some noise or maybe had some scratchy controls. Uh, the fuses, this is supposed to be a one amp time delay fuse or slow blow as you want to say it. And it looks like a one amp fuse if it'll focus for you. So this one's good. That's always a good sign. And let's see what they have. Now the mains fuse is going to depend upon what line voltage you're running. So the mains is set for 120. So for anything from 110 to 140 you would use a 5 amp fuse. And for European power 210 up to 240 you would drop that to a 2 amp fuse. And I've seen amps come with the wrong fuse in them before because they were restrapped for a different power. So this should be a 5 amp and it is. You can pretty clearly see it's a 5 amp fuse. So we have the correct fuses. And again being that it looks as if it has been recapped and some things, uh, probably the amp will work. So let's get a speaker and let's get a power cord. Let's see what kind of front end tubes are on this thing. This is a, a 7025 and I can't tell what it is but definitely looks like an old one. It's not a real modern tube so that's probably a good thing. 7025 is it's kind of like a low noise 12AX7 is the best way to describe it. Fenders use those a lot in their amplifiers. Again, I'm not a big expert on these amps, so any of you wants to chime in there. There's a JJ, and that's probably a 12AX7, I would say. ECC83, yeah, that's a 12AX7. So that's a modern tube. This is probably going to be your cathodine phase inverter tube, I would think. I don't know. Like I said, I have no schematics. Another JJ ECC 33. And then you probably come out of, with this amp, you probably come out of your cathodine and go into two like voltage amplifier drivers which would be your your final 12AX7 right here and there it is and it is an electro harmonics so quite the tube complement so let's uh, flip this around and connect it up to a speaker and see if we get any sound all right, so we have taken the amplifier out of the cabinet, and I have to say the cabinet weighs almost as much as this stupid amp here. It was a really well-built cabinet. I think it was designed to last a lifetime. <laughs> so anyway, as we can see here, now we can see all the caps that they replaced. I still haven't flipped this thing over and looked underneath. Um, again, they said that it's working but it has a few issues with noise and so forth. So let's see what they're talking about. I have this thing plugged into my Variac setup, so we'll bring it up slowly. Um, even though the owner said that they can, they turn it on and, you know, just normally, we're gonna bring it up slowly just so we can kind of hear how it reacts. Uh, a couple things I noticed, the transformer bells here, <laughs> there's one screw holding it on. There are no other screws holding this transformer together. And on this other one, the power transformer, the bells are bent over a little bit. And uh, I can't imagine for the life of me why there would be a screw missing from in here. But obviously this amp has had quite a bit of service done on it. So that's a little bit scary. So who knows what we're going to see when we look underneath. But let's try to turn it on first. All right, I will give you a quick rundown on what we have uh, for our little Variac setup. This is a new thing. It's been on my bench for a couple months, but I really haven't used it because I've been so tied up on that uh, 
SX1980 project, which I didn't need this for. But on the top, that little flashing box you see up there is a uh, isolation transformer, and it's been modified. It's a medical grade one that I had uh, on a system that we removed from service. And uh, it's basically just a big toroid transformer, and it is an isolation transformer. So it isolates whatever is connected to this unit uh, from the outside incoming line. It, it isolates it from ground, it isolates the neutral and so forth, so you have a totally isolated signal or power source. It then feeds into this great big variac on my bench here, which then feeds the power input of this neat little box here that I got. And this is really kind of the, the thing that makes this whole thing what it is. And sorry about some of the reflections on it from the light. It's kind of hard to get. But what this is is a power meter. And it works in a very similar manner to the, those little plug-in units that we have, the kilowatt units, if you've heard of those. And the difference is this particular unit has its own separate power supply for all of the displays and logic. So in other words, you have one power input that powers the, the meter and the display, and then you have a separate power loop that is completely isolated that is used by the monitoring circuit that you're actually monitoring. What that allows us to do is you can connect a variac to this and you can check your voltage all the way from zero volts all the way up to your you know 120 or 125 whatever your mains voltage is so it's a very neat system so uh, and the power to drive the display is not dependent upon the power coming from the variac neat little setup took me a while to find one of these uh, unit T UNI T makes this, which is a very popular, common, uh, low-cost test equipment company. They make, uh, you know, all kinds of things like amp clamps and multimeters and things like that. This must not have been very popular and didn't catch on because they're not very easy to see, find, uh, even on like eBay and Amazon, places like that. It's a model UTE-1010A. So in case you're interested in this. So anyway, and you can toggle between uh, line frequency, power factor. Um, it checks the power on this end in watts, the current, the voltage, everything. So it's a really neat all-in-one piece of test equipment. So anyway, I'm going to turn, I have the amp turned on. I have it plugged in. And I'll just show you the first part of this as I power it up. So we'll put like 30 volts on it. And you can see around 31 volts. It shows us it's 60 hertz because that's the mains over here in America. I can push this little button and it doesn't do anything. Wait a second, I'm pushing the wrong button. There we go. There's your power factor. Sorry, I was pushing the wrong button. So, your power factor is 1 because this is a transformer and there's no, uh, no capacitive load or anything right now. So, anyway, that's what's going to happen. I'm just going to keep turning this up. We're going to go up to a little bit more. And I have a speaker plugged in, but I'm going to move you over to the amp here in a second. So let's go 50 volts. And we should start seeing some things warm up. So let's move down to the amp now. Okay, we're still at 50 volts. And I have the master volume turned down. And we're just going to turn it up right now. And there's no noise or no sound yet which I wouldn't expect at 50 volts. So let's go up a little more. We're going to go up to 75. All 
all right 75 volts and it's drawing about 5 amps or I'm sorry 500 milliamps and it's equating to about 41 watts of current and you of power and you can see the filaments are starting to glow a little bit and if I turn my volume up we're getting a little bit of noise now and I think we're picking up some noise which doesn't surprise me because this is a very high gain amp and I have the, the thing sitting right here on a bench it's not sitting on its shield that's inside the uh, the cabinet so that's normal but I'm not hearing any noise yet out of the ordinary all right let's turn it up some more okay we're at a hundred volts now I'm getting a lot of buzz but again that could be yeah whoa so we got a loose tube socket so let me turn that way down see that so we have a loose tube socket so that's probably part of his noise that he's talking about okay let's uh, let's try it out and see if we can plug an instrument in and see if we can get any sound okay so I have this thing hooked up to my really out of tune old strings guitar that's been laying around here I haven't even messed with it but it does make the sound um, among all the buzz but what I noticed is the preamp one volume pot and I will zoom you down on it here this guy right here has got some really serious issues starting to work in now a little bit I've been moving it but it's definitely definitely been uh, is a dirty pot so honestly I think all that this thing really needs is a good cleaning well here we are with the underneath and it doesn't look as good as I thought it would one of the interesting things about this amp, just kind of looking at it, and then we'll get into some of the things I found, is the AOR itself. AOR stands for Advanced Overdrive Response. Advanced Overdrive Response. And really what it is, is they're using some circuitry to switch in an extra gain stage. So the amp can actually be two different types of amplifier it can be one that has a little bit less aggressive overdrive or it can be one of those really aggressive overdrive amplifiers just with the flick of a button or a step of a foot switch and I'm just starting to learn how they're doing it here by looking at some of the schematics of the other AOR amplifiers out there now here's the problem this amp has been worked on quite a bit. On the surface when you first look at it, it doesn't seem to be, but as I move around, um, let's start with some of the good stuff. So if we zoom in on the capacitors, and you can see they've been upgraded to uh, JJ capacitors, which are very good quality, and you can see they did a really good job on the soldering. Uh, now something that I'm not so sure about is if I zoom back out just a little bit and we move this up just a little bit you see right here these are your your grid your your control grid resistors um, they're 5.6 K and you can see they're just they're not even twisted they're just tack soldered together 
with a wire stuck in the middle. Now, I can hardly believe that Laney would have... Now, I don't, you know, like I said, this is the first Laney amplifier I've ever worked on. But I can hardly believe that they would build something like this. Um, this is your screen grid resistor. And they're using 1K screen grid resistors. Um, it's a pretty typical circuit. And it does look kind of characteristic of how Marshall does it. But where it starts to get different is when we get over here to the circuit board. And right off the bat, the first thing I can see, let me turn on some extra light here, is if you look at these, these little chips here. There's one here, and there's one right here. And these are opto-couplers, or opto-isolators, however you want to word it. Essentially what it is, is a, an LED and then a, a light-controlled semiconductor all inside this little package. And as you can tell, this one's lifted off the board pretty bad. This one's really lifted off the board. As you can see, I can put the, this little pointer all the way under there. And what it looks like is that these have been replaced. And it looks like they just cut the leads off rather than lifting the board and then tack soldered the other one on top. And if you get close enough to this, let me move this out and you can see it. You can see the blobs of solder here that are kind of like shorting some of the leads. And I see quite a bit of this inside here the closer I look. There's little pieces of solder all over this thing. Um, like right here's one floating around. Uh, just they're kind of floating around everywhere. So at the very least we're going to need to clean that up. So researching this a little bit further, it looks like the schematic that matches this, at least the most closely matches this, and I think it might even be the exact one, is it's listed in two different ways online. First of all, it's listed as the A100H, and then there's also this one floating around out there called the AOR100H. So you can see the AOR is controlled by these two little opto isolators, these H11F1s, and all they're doing is they're just switching in different resistances into the circuits to change the gain and so forth. Also, for the base boost, you have these two little JFETs. And what they're doing is, these are depletion mode JFETs. And what they're doing is, when you switch them on, they open up and unshort these capacitors and puts these capacitors in this circuit. When you turn these off, these will short out because they're depletion mode and it will essentially bypass these capacitors straight to ground. So that's actually what you're using for your your base boost circuit. So that's what that is. Kind of neat. So anyway, this is what we're looking at. And what where we're at right now is I still have not heard back from the owner how far he wants to take this. But what I am going to start on is at least trying to clean up some of this mess over here. So I'm going to take this, I got this up about as far as I can go, and I'm going to pull all these knobs out and uh, just remove it as one entire unit so that we can flip this whole thing upside down and clean up any of the solder joints there that may need it. From that point on, we're kind of in a waiting game to hear back from the owner to see what he wants to do. Now that all the knobs are pulled, we can kind of see all the crud down in here that we need to clean up. We can see that this potentiometer has been replaced, but it is the correct value and everything, so we're not worried about that. And now we can get to all the parts on the boards to properly uh, resolder them and replace those chips. Alright, so as you can see, we got the caps replaced. We got these little sockets put in, which are much neater than what, the way that was cobbled in there. And this is ready to put back together. All the solder joints are good. Everything's perfect. But I found why we have so much noise and buzz. These are special jacks. You see them in um, the, a lot of the, the British amplifiers, like the, 
the uh, marshals and so forth. And these are switched mono jacks. And as you can see, there these pins are bent really badly. So that's the problem. Um, I may try to fix them. If I can't get them to work to my liking, I do have spares of these, so I can replace them. So uh, that's our next thing. We're going to clean this all up in here and make sure that's good. And these have to work, or it's going to mess up the impedance, it's going to mess up the inputs. Um, these really have to be <laughs> switched in solidly, so and you can see how badly bent they are. So let's fix that up and let's continue on and get the jacks put back in and then we can start looking at some of the mods that were done on the uh, the preamp knob. So we have the the H11 F1s installed and I had some of those we used to use tons of these for different things but really this is nothing but a fancy switch that's all this is there's nothing it doesn't affect the sound or anything like that just think of this as an electronic switch so that when you step on a foot pedal or something it triggers it triggers this chip which closes the electronic contacts um, to bring in the part of the circuit that you want that's really what these are anyway looking back over here as messy as this is this is the correct circuit layout that belongs on here but since you remember I said earlier that this potentiometer has been replaced this is just kind of the wiring job they did when they replaced the pot so what we're going to do is we're going to remove all this and redo it neatly so that it looks a little better and uh, hopefully it will be a little bit less noisy too so uh, let me do that and then we'll come back and see how it looks that's much better so we got it everything in there the right way and we just kind of cleaned up all the wires along there and I just couldn't stand those things floating out in midair I know that's probably factory the way it was but uh, I put some terminal strips in there just so these aren't moving around keep them steady and I uh, kind of rerouted them so they're a little bit better and that should hold up really well kind of cleaned up some of the wire dressing and so forth and really all we need to do is uh, I need to do something with these and then I need to clean the tube sockets and I think we're ready to do another test run. So you know we have to look at a schematic if uh, if this is an X-ray Tony B video. We can't get away without it, huh? <laughs> so what we're going to look is uh, how we're going to bias these tubes. We're going to set the bias on them. Now tube biasing can be a whole video in and of itself and really the purpose of this video is, is fixing up and restoring this Laney amplifier and not really doing a, a full course on how tubes are biased and how they conduct and how they work so I'm just gonna kind of skip ahead of that part I will mention that this tube or this amplifier uses fixed bias on the output as opposed to cathode bias uh, any of you who service amps will, will immediately know that when you look at this schematic, how it's put together. But in order to do that, to, to adjust the bias, we're going to adjust a negative voltage power supply that's being applied to these grids of these tubes. And what we want to do is we want to set these tubes to run at about anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of their maximum operating power. So for instance, let's look at the tube sheet here. If we look at a typical EL34, maximum wattage on this is 25 watts per tube. So remember this is a 100 watt guitar amplifier. Guess what? There's four tubes here and if you take 25 times 4 that would be 100 watts. And that's where they're getting that number from. But really, if we turn, this, turn these tubes to run at their maximum, if we bias them so that they are each conducting 25 watts at idle, what's going to happen is these tubes are going to get extremely hot and it's going to shorten the life of the tubes. You may get a little more output from the amp. It may cause it to have a little bit different distortion characteristics or clean sound characteristics, but it's at the expense of the tube. There are guitar players 
who purposely do this. They don't care about the life of the tubes. They care about the effect that it gives them. Remember, when you're working on a guitar amplifier, it's much different than the audio amplifiers we do a lot of on this channel. The amplifier is every bit as much an instrument as the guitar that's plugging into it. Uh, the guitar amp very much colors the sound. It does affect the sound of, of the guitar. So what we do here is going to affect that sound. It's also going to affect the life of the tubes. It's going to affect different components in the amplifier. All of these things need to be taken into consideration when you're setting that bias. Now a general rule of thumb is you take the rating of the tube, which in this case is 25 watts, and you go either 60, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. So for instance with this, if we went 70 percent for instance, it would, it would come out to approximately 17.5 watts. And it would be about 15 watts if you wanted to go 60 percent. So somewhere between 15 and 17.5 watts is really a good spot to bias these tubes. Now here's the problem we're going to run into with that. You got to keep all your numbers straight. So we got to know that 70 percent equals 17.5 watts per tube and 60 percent equals 15 watts per tube. Now, that's since we have two tubes on each side, this is a 100 watt amp, so what they're doing is to get that 100 watts, they have to gang these tubes up. So 50 watts and 50 watts. So what you're going to see is you have these two tied together and these two tied together to give you your 100 watts. So you got four tubes there. So we actually have to look at two tubes. So if we have 17.5 watts per tube, then that's going to be times two per side, right? Is going to equal about 35 watts per side in this case. And it's going to be about times two equals 30 watts per side at 60 percent. So what that means is if we measure from across this pair of tubes that are tied in parallel, we should see somewhere between 30 and 35 watts across the tubes, okay? Not anywhere else, but actually flowing through the tubes, you should have about 35 watts of dissipation combined between them. Same thing on this side. And at 60 percent, it's going to be about 30 watts. So somewhere between 30 and 35 watts. Now, how do we measure this? Well, there are several different methods. Now, method number one would be if there was some sort of a measuring test point in here and the service manual tells you to put your meter on the test point and measure for some certain value and adjust the bias pot over here, which is adjusting that negative voltage, uh, until you get a certain value. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it would be you can actually lift the cathode and you can place either an amp meter or some sort of a very small value resistor or something in here between the cathode and ground and you can measure the voltage drop and calculate things. That's not my favorite way to do it. Another way is they sell these little sockets and all this socket is is they interrupt pin 8 which is the cathode pin and they put if you look down inside there you might be able to see way down in there see it there's a little resistor it's a 1 ohm resistor and they put a 1 ohm resistor between ground and that cathode so when you measure these two wires these, these two probes here that plug into your voltmeter are going to measure the voltage drop across that resistor and you can use Ohm's law to calculate the actual current and then figure out your bias from there. Again, 
not entirely my favorite way to do it. Now the way I'm going to show you is definitely one of the most complicated but also the most accurate and the least invasive because you're not changing the circuit or interrupting the circuit in any way. But it is going to require a little bit of math and it is going to require a little bit of measurement more so than what we do uh, using these other methods. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. I'll give you an overview and then we're going to go up to the amp and do it as I talk about it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to measure statically how many ohms of resistance, DC resistance, these windings are on this transformer. So this is your audio output transformer. This wire coming down here, this black wire, this actually has your high voltage. So if we look, if we kind of move across with the schematic here, you can see this goes all the way through the, that fuse that's on the back of the amp chassis and it comes all the way down and it goes to the output of this. This is your 460 volts. See it? So you have 460 volts going straight down into the center tap of that transformer. And what we're going to do is with the amplifier turned off, all of the capacitors fully discharged. That is extremely important. Okay? I've shown you guys this in other videos. Make yourself one of these stinger cables and discharge your capacitors after you unplug the amplifier completely, okay? Make sure there is no stray voltage in there. We don't want to get our test equipment damaged and we certainly don't want to get ourselves damaged. Then we're going to take our ohm meter set to ohms. So here it is, the ohm meter. We're going to set it to ohms like that. We're going to take a set of probes and connect them to our meter. Like that. And we're going to measure right from here to here and from here to here. So we're going to measure these two things and we're going to write down how many ohms DC that is. So let's go up here and let's take a look at that. So right here is the black wire that we were looking at on the schematic. It goes onto the board right here. And then we have the red wire and the blue wire, which are the two wires on there. So first one we're going to look at is the red wire over here. And you can see here's the red wire coming from the transformer right here. See it? And then there's another red wire coming off of that pin, that's pin 3, which is your anode, around to the other tube. So they're tied in parallel. So we're going to connect our ohm meter just like that. So we're reading from the red wire to the black wire of the transformer. If we come back here and we look, we have about 15.74 ohms there. Okay. So right here, we're going to write down 15.74, okay, ohms. Now we're going to take that wire that's up here, the red wire, and we're going to move it down here to this blue wire. So let's move up here. I'm going to come off of here. We're going to go on to our blue wire, which is right there. Okay, here's the blue wire going into the pin 3 of the other side. We're going to measure it. And you can see it's about 16.95 ohms. So 16.95 ohms. There you have it. Now that's really important. Those are the two values we're going to be using here uh, to calculate everything. Now, our meter is set to ohms. Very important for the next step. What you want to do is you want to move to DC volts. So we changed it, changed it from ohms to volts. We're now going to connect the probes back up exactly the same way we had them when we were reading the resistance. And we're going to turn on the amplifier and we're going to actually measure there you go. And we have our probes connected back up. Here, let me get it. 
just like that. And we're going to come back down here and turn the amp on, and we're going to measure the voltage there. So give me a second to turn the amp on and get it hooked up. Okay, the amplifier is turned on, but I have the standby switch turned off right now. So that means that the filaments of the tubes are heating up to warm up the amp, but there's no high voltage yet. We're going to turn that 460 volts on here in just a second. So that's essentially what your standby switch is. When you flip the standby switch, you're actually applying that 460 volts right into that center tap. And we're going to read right now the voltage drop from here to here. All right, so here we go. Let's do it. And you can see right there we have about one volt, almost exactly one volt. All right, so let's write that down. I'm going to shut this back off and I'm going to write here one volt. Just so we can remember. Then we're going to take our meter and we're very carefully, now we got capacitors and things to deal with in here, we got to be careful. And we're going to move back over to our blue wire. And it doesn't matter which tube, the tubes are tied together, remember? So we're back on, now we're looking at the other side. And let's connect our, there we go. And let's look and what we get. And you can see it's about 1.08. I'm going to just put that down. 1.08. All right. Okay, now that we have that, let's do a little bit, uh, let's write a couple things down. I've taken a piece of paper and I've written down our information that each side we have 15.74 ohms and we had one volt across that winding and we had 16.95 ohms and 1.08 volts across the other winding. And if we use Ohm's law, current equals the voltage divided by the resistance or I equals V over R. So if we take V, which is 1 volt, divided by R, which is 15.74 ohms, we get 0 0.0635. So red and black equals 63.5 MA, or milliamps. And the blue and the black is going to equal 1.08 volts divided by 16.95 ohms and it's going to be 0 0.0637 amps which is 63.7 milliamps. Now the first thing that tells me is that those two sides are pretty well matched. Even though those are unmatched tubes, those pairs are pretty closely matched. Let's say that one side was way different than the other. Well, what that means, if that's the case, if we see that, is that one side of the amp is turned on more than the other. And you have to remember, <laughs> this is a push-pull amplifier. So one pair of tubes and the other pair of tubes this pair of tubes, if you have a sine wave, right? So we have a signal that does that, where it goes positive and then swings negative. This pair of tubes handles the positive half cycle. This pair of tubes has the negative half cycle. So during this portion, these tubes will be turned on and these will be turned off and vice versa. When this part, on this part of the cycle, this pair is turned on and this pair is turned off. What will happen is if we have that, if, if these are turned on differently, they're biased differently, what's going to happen is instead of getting a nice symmetrical waveform, you'll probably get something that'll look more like this. 
Now, I'm exaggerating the drawing, but what's going to happen is this, this side here is going to clip eventually. In other words, you'll hit the maximum turn on of this tube and you're going to get a clipping, which is going to look like this. But this side is still going to be working properly so you'll get an imbalance. It won't be symmetrical. So it's important that those tubes be balanced. Now there are people that will purposely use tubes that are mismatched to cause this to happen because that, uh, that creates a distortion type effect. Not what I would recommend. There's other ways to get distortion that are easier on the amp, but it is a valid thing that people do. I've seen it done. In the proper world, when you do things the way that the factory designed it, you want these tubes to be matched. Now, in this particular amplifier, there is no mechanism to match the tubes. So when you purchase tubes, they have to be matched to one another. In other words, every tube that's made is slightly different. They're all kind of unique. And the idea is you want to find sets of tubes that have the same emissions, uh, you know, characteristics so that they perform the same with the same amounts of voltages applied to the elements. That's what tube matching is. It's to make sure that this doesn't happen. So when we see numbers that are this close together to one another, that tells us that these tubes, even though they're different manufacturers, they are pretty closely matched to one another, which is a good thing. So now what are we going to do? We, let's go back to the, our tube sheet here. If you recall, we want the tube to run somewhere between 60 and 70 percent um, to be in its safe operating. That's going to give the tube the longest life, and it's also going to allow it to perform pretty much the way that it was designed by the manufacturer. So the problem is we're looking at milliamps, but if you notice here, this is looking at watts. So how do we take that milliamps and convert it to watts, okay? So what we want to see is, remember, we want for each pair of tubes, we want somewhere between 30 and 35 watts. So now we're going to find out how we do that. Now let's just look at this circuit again for a minute. We have our 460 volts coming into this tap. This, is, this coil is actually a solid piece of wire, right? and it's a bunch of windings around that core of that transformer and it's relatively low low uh, DC resistance you know 15 ohms 16 ohms so but if you look at the current path it comes from the power supply comes down into this tap it flows this way and this way and you can see and I'm using conventional flow not electron flow comes through here it flows through these pairs of tubes and to ground. So your return path to ground, see, ground, ground. Okay, so it's from the power supply, through the transformer, through the tube, and to ground. If we want to know what kind of uh, wattage these tubes are dissipating at idle, one thing we can remember is that current is always going to be the same at every node in a series circuit. So no matter where I measure the current, if I break that circuit anywhere in there, the current is going to be the same. So that 63 milliamps, if there's 63.5 milliamps flowing from here to here and down to here, then there's also 63.5 milliamps flowing through here, through these two tubes. Um, however, each tube will handle a portion of that, and it should, in a perfect world, be exactly half of that 63. But we'll get more into that in another video. So, we know then, by measuring what's flowing through this transformer, which is a known set DC resistance, we know that if it's 63.5 milliamps here, that we have 63.5 milliamps flowing through the tubes to ground, right? Now all we need to know to be able to use Ohm's law is how many volts are there between the anode 
and the cathode. So if I measure this point here and look at the voltage drop, and I know that there's 63.5 milliamps, I take that voltage times times that current, because volts times amps equals watts, I will get my wattage. So that's what we're going to do right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect our meter now, our voltmeter. We're going to connect the positive lead here and the negative lead here. So we're essentially reading, since these are tied in parallel and these are parallel, we will be reading the actual voltage drop across this pair of tubes. So let's do that. So all we're going to do is simply remove this probe from that black wire on the transformer and we're going to connect it to the cathode which is tied to ground if you see down there. So we are now looking at that. So now let's turn the amp back on the, and let's wake my sleeping meter back up. And let's see what we get. Nasty voltage. See that? 470 volts. So we're going to write that down. 470 volts. We're now going to then take our probe. We're going to turn the standby back off. And see those caps bleeding off? It takes a while. You can't just reach in there <laughs> or you're going to get a nasty surprise. So be careful. Again, you're doing this at your own risk. And we're going to connect to the other channel, which is right here. And we're going to read our voltage on there. And that's 468.5, let's say. 468.5. There we go. Volts. We now have all the information we need. So let's come over here and do the math. So our watts equals voltage times current right so if we take the 63.5 milliamps which is we have to convert the milliamps into amps so it's 0 0.0635 times 470 what does that equal We're going to equal 29.85 watts, and on this side we have 63.7 milliamps, or 0 0.0637 amps, times 468.5 volts is going to equal 28 or 29.8, right about 0 0.84 or 0 0.85 watts. So we said we wanted somewhere between 30 and 35 watts. So this amp is actually biased a little bit cool right now. Nothing wrong with that, but we can actually turn that up a little bit if we wanted to. And we're going to. We're going to change that just a little bit. So all we have to do now is increase that voltage just a little bit. and we should be right where we need to be. Okay, we're connected back up to our amplifier and you can see we're back across that winding and we're going to adjust that voltage drop just a little bit. If you remember it was somewhere on the blue side it was about 1.08 volts and what we're going to do is we're going to adjust it to be just a little bit more than that. So we're going to go here. We're just going to go right around one point, let's say 1.15. And let's go back and do the numbers again and see where we're at. 
Okay, with that uh, voltage, that voltage drop set from 1.08 to 1.15, that brings our wattage, doing the numbers again, up to about 31, a little over 31 watts. So we're getting about 31 and 0.2 watts. So we can actually go a wee little bit more than that. Um, but I'm probably going to leave it like that because again we're going to run these tubes cool because number one I don't think the owner of the amp is going to play it uh, worry so much about that that extra power and number two we want the tubes to last a long time so right there we're biased at about somewhere in that 31 watt range for each uh, each side which I think is really good that's right over that 60 percent 61 62 percent range and again the tubes are going to be a little bit different from one another so we want they'll be plus or minus a watt you know so the amp is biased now once again uh, if we would have left it right where it was when we found it it pro it would have been just fine I think it would have been okay but I wanted to put that slight adjustment just to kind of show you the concept of how it works now again that is the long way to calculate and do this. Um, there are tools, there are actual pieces of test equipment where you can actually plug one of those little socket things in like this. It looks similar to this, but it'll have a little readout on it. I think one of them is called the Bias King. And it can read the voltage and the current at the same time and it can calculate the wattage of dissipation or you can just do the math the simple you know plus minus times divide thing and find it out very quickly and it's a lot faster than the process I just showed you um, however again you're putting something in the circuit you're putting that one ohm resistor which isn't a whole lot but some people will argue that um, you are influencing the circuit a little bit by putting that in there. Does it make that big a difference? To me it doesn't. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to show you this method because it doesn't require any special tools and it's, it is the most accurate way to measure what's going on inside the amp. It's dangerous because you're poking around with the high voltages but when you do it that way you absolutely have no doubt um, what it is that, uh, that that's, the tubes are biased at. And once you get good at it, you start to realize what voltages are what pretty easily. Like that first guess I made at that 1.15 was just a guess, an educated guess that I did. I didn't sit and reverse the math or whatever. I could, but I didn't. So anyway, there you go. There is a how to bias one of these amps.